All right, first of all, I have to say I am the perennial rule breaker. I didn't know there weren't supposed to be podiums, so I have a podium. Um, first of all, I want to know how many people brought their own water bottles? This is totally random. Water bottles? All right, next conference, I'd like a commitment that everyone's going to bring their own water bottles and not use plastic water bottles. Can I have that? It's important, guys. All right, so first of all, I want to say, obviously, I'm so honored to be here. Um, you know, scared, nervous, excited, all that. But I, I'm overwhelmed, too, because 25 years ago when I moved here from university, after graduating from University of Michigan, in a million years, I could have never guessed that there would be this many people and this many young people gathered to talk about Detroit and the future of Detroit. So it is an honor to speak in front of you. And I also have to say, I feel like I'm increasing the diversity of the crowd by increasing the median age by about 20 years. Okay, sorry, I'm really bad at part. Where's the screen thing? Oh, I don't see it. Oh, I see it. Haha. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it turns out that graduating from U of M in 1988 before we used computers and then running an artisan bakery for uh, 20 years doesn't really teach you a lot about technology. Who knew? <laughs> so I was asked to talk about the future of Detroit, which is a great subject. And immediately when I was asked, I decided to talk about changing the narrative. So why is that important? Because the narrative are the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. It's the stories we tell ourselves about our surroundings. And those stories become the realities that we create. But sometimes those narratives aren't true. But they persist until there are people who are bold enough to challenge them, not by words, but by actions, by creating new realities which define new narratives. So I grew up in Bloomfield Hills, about 30 miles north of here. And when I was growing up, we told ourselves that white people weren't wanted in the city. So white people left. We told ourselves that Detroit wasn't a place to raise children. Families left. We told ourselves that Detroit was closed for business. Businesses left. Now, I'm not naive. It's not that these narratives don't contain some truth, and that they couldn't be illustrated by lots of anecdotes and lots of personal narratives. I've heard a lot of them, my parents, for instance. But it's that the common narrative becomes the only story that is told, and that it defines reality, which then determines our behavior, which reinforces the narrative, which defines reality, which determines behavior. I think you know where I'm going with this. But how do I know this to be true? Because 17 years ago, Ann Peralt and I changed the narrative in the Cass Quarter of Detroit by opening Avalon International Breads, a socially responsible bakery in a formerly underserved neighborhood. Now, this might be a little hard for some of you to imagine because in 1997, some of you were barely born and others were in second grade. But at that time, when we opened the bakery, the narrative was pretty much uniform. Detroit was closed for business. Now, it was easy to see why people thought that. The white and black middle class were rushing out. The Bush and locally the Angler administration had been dismantling the safety net. And in the winter of 1996, on Cass and Willis, just one block away, imagine this. There was a tent city where 300 homeless people were sleeping outside in the middle of the winter. The narrative seemed obvious. The situation was hopeless. But Anna and I saw a different reality. We could see it as clearly as we could see the tent city. We saw a bakery that would be an oasis of warmth and health, where fresh bread would nourish our bodies and authentic relationships would heal our souls. Our values, earth, community, and employees, now standard fare, were unfamiliar to most at the time, but informed not only the way our business grew, 
but how the community developed around us. We went from four employees, Ann and myself and two other employees, to a current budget of $2.2 million and over 60 employees, most of whom live in the city with an average wage of $12 an hour and full benefits. And now we're changing the narrative again by opening a 50,000 square foot manufacturing facility in a dilapidated industrial neighborhood near the old Packard plant on the east side, which we believe could eventually become a live-work neighborhood once again. So we redefined business as something that happens to a community to something that emerges from a community. And as a result, dozens of like-minded businesses have emerged alongside our flagship store, along with thousands of new residential and commercial developments. And the Cass Corridor, the once infamous neighborhood for drugs and violence, has become Midtown, which is fait accompli, as an example that Detroit is on the rebound. But today I'm going to talk about other projects that are forging a new way, changing the narrative, not by talking about it, but by changing the story of Detroit as a city of victims to a city of innovation. I call these people the solutionaries of Detroit, but they're really the new storytellers. They're weaving the new narrative. The James and Grace Lee Boggs School, a new charter school on the east side of Detroit in a neighborhood I almost guarantee almost none of you have ever been to, and I had only been to for the first time a few weeks ago. The common narrative here was no one lives here. The situation for children is hopeless. Okay, tell that to the children, the teachers, and the staff who are growing an innovative school based on place-based education, where the curriculum actually centers around building relationships, rebuilding their community, and changing lives. Julia, the co Julia Putnam, the co-founder, of this school, and a DPS graduate, I might add, says this. She says, we've been growing our economy, and this is where it's gotten us. These vacant lots, these abandoned houses, it's like, well, industry is not working here, and I can make more money someplace else. So I ship it out, and the jobs are gone, and people can't afford these houses, so they leave them. And then she asks us, so what happens if we grow our souls here? What would it look like then? I want to prepare kids to ask those questions because that's what's going to create the future, asking these questions. Not thinking we have the answers and then telling kids what they should be doing. Julia, Amanda, Stephanie, my heroes at the Boggs School, are teaching the kids, they're building their capacity to tell their own stories and build their own future. African Bead Museum, Grand River, west side of Detroit. Who's been there? Gotta go. The narrative. The neighborhood is vacant. It's too dangerous to live in for business, much less the most magnificent outdoor art installation in the city, much less the region. Now, Dabble, the co-founder and the artist, has a narrative for those of us who are willing to stop and listen carefully and look. Iron teaching rocks how to rust. His art shows both the beauty born out of visionary transportation, transformation and how one person changing the narrative in a dangerous neighborhood can live safely and inspire others to do so. He's redefining art, not as aesthetic window dressing or diversion, but as a process of social transformation. The urban agriculture movement of Detroit. Now, I don't know if many of you know this, but the urban agriculture movement of Detroit is probably the most innovative urban agriculture movement in the world. Now, before that, I'm talking 10 years ago, the common narrative was that Detroit's vacant land is an eyesore. It prevents development and neighborhood health. And Detroit's a food desert where healthy food can't be procured and violence and chronic illness are intractable. That is, until Keep Growing Detroit, Black Community Food Security Network, Earthworks, Farnsworth Community, Greening of Detroit, 
supported the growth of 1,500 gardens and schools and block clubs and neighborhoods in churches. 20,000 farmers, that's one in 40 Detroit residents, more than almost any other city in the world, grew 150 tons of organic produce in the city of Detroit last summer. So neighborhoods, yeah, it's pretty, pretty awesome. So in Brightmore, neighbors, in a west side neighborhood called Brightmore, neighbor, neighbors have come out of isolation, pushing out drug dealers and creating a web of community and interdependence, reusing vacant buildings as community spaces. So we're redefining the use of open space, as well as urban life, organic agriculture in the 21st century, creating what I call an agra-urban economy that is empowering Detroiters and attracting young people from all over the world. Now my last story is a very personal one, and it's the story of the Isaac Avery Downtown Synagogue. Now I've lived in Detroit for 25 years, I'm Jewish, and for most of that time I considered myself pretty much the only Jewish person who lived in Detroit, which isn't that far from the truth. Now the narrative was obvious, there's not enough Jews to, live, to have a synagogue, young Jews aren't even interested in religion. People in a primarily African-American city won't sustain a Jewish community. And maybe most importantly, a Jewish community based in downtown where the synagogue was is separate from the neighborhoods. Well, the downtown synagogue has become a place where not only do Jewish Detroiters pray, learn, and play, but Jews drive down from the suburbs and non-Jewish Detroiters support the vibrant Jewish rituals and the epic dance parties. Most importantly, the Detroit, the downtown synagogue through the Eden Gardens project has partnered with a socially isolated neighborhood called Eden Gardens across from City Airport to help support a vibrant neighborhood that is breathing new life and healthy food into the community. Its residents and our synagogue congregants were creating real relationships based on mutual needs for healing, connection, and mutual transformation. As my friend Marsha Music says, we don't live in Detroit to, to heal the city. We live in Detroit so we can be healed. Now one of my mentors, my main competitor, but someone I respect very much is Ari Weisenzweig, pronounced it wrong, I'm sure, from the founder of um, Zingerman's Community of Businesses. And he says the job of a leader is to define reality. So I challenge all of us today as citizens, as students of our city, and as civic leaders to define reality not based on what we hear or even necessarily what we see with our eyes, but what we believe in our hearts and what we're ready to challenge with our lives. These solutionaries of Detroit change the narrative by creating a new reality based on what we knew to be true, that Detroit is a vibrant, resilient community of 700,000 people who've been struggling, creating, learning, surviving here for decades when the rest of the world wrote us off as dead. That we have a cultural heritage, a political history, a soul that does not need to be taken over. We are not a blank slate. It is a story of Detroit creating new paradigms which don't wait for corporations or provide jobs to, to us or government to support us. This is a Detroit where the citizens create the city that we see in our hearts, a city of beauty, of community, of spirituality, and of commerce. So you have to look a little beneath the surface for this narrative, for these realities, but this is where the magic lies. Thank you.